I think it is clear to believe in the power of ideas. Fresh, thank you for the Manhattan Institute. Hello again. We've been speaking about change in the American University, and we're fortunate to have a luncheon speaker today who has instigated and seen through change at one of our most important universities. To introduce Robert George, it's my pleasure to introduce Peter Flanagan, a longtime trustee of the Manhattan Institute and the founder of the Center for the American University's Veritas Fund, which Jim Pearson, Jim Pearson described earlier a generous educational philanthropist, an advisor to UBS Securities, and uh, somebody who's been uh, a wonderful supporter of the Institute for so many years, Peter Flanagan. Thank you, Howard, and congratulations again on the way in which you moderated that panel this morning. That was extremely well done. Ladies and gentlemen, Princeton, of which I'm an alumnus, has uh, been the scene and the source of the very political argument in which we are so much engaged today. James Madison, class of 1771, a little before me, uh, was a towering proponent, proponent of a political regime based on natural law and human nature. Woodrow Wilson, who was the class of 1879, believed that it was the function of government to, to, uh, and the state to regulate the evolution of human nature. On most campuses today, as this morning's comments on uh, the political leanings of the, of the uh, uh, faculty, Wilson, his view is in the ascendancy. As a Princeton professor, Wilson, Wilson held the chair, in fact it was created for him, of the McCormick Professor of Jurisprudence. Today, that chair is held by Robert George, known to all of us as Robbie. And Robbie looks back to Madison and to the founders for his inspiration. Not content with only teaching uh, the Madison the vision on the campus, he decided to do something more and he founded the Madison Program on American Ideals and Institutions. And that came about this way. The Ethics Department at Princeton, about a decade ago, hired a professor whose views on ethics were, some would say extreme, but at least they were different than the average American's views on ethics. And uh, that caused a bit of upset or in the Board of Trustees. And Robbie, believing as a recent inhabitant of the White House, did that no crisis should go wasted, <laughs> called on the then president and said, I see you've got this problem and maybe you could build a backfire if you would allow me to start a program on American ideals and institutions. The president was grateful, open-minded, and said, that'd be fine, but you have to raise your own resources. So Robbie picked up the phone, and who did he call? Our own Jim Pearson, and said he'd like to call on him and discuss this opportunity. And Jim kindly asked me as a trustee of the Olin Foundation to, and a Princeton alumnus to come and join him for that, uh, <coughs> for that meeting. Robbie described what he wanted to do. Jim immediately said, yes, we want to help. And the Olin Foundation 
provided the resources for the first couple of years. The profound success of Robbie's vision, Jim's understanding, and that, and that uh, program is evidenced by the changes in the campus of Princeton. Debates which were almost exclusively Wilsonian are now at Princeton equally Madisonian. And Robbie, who the alumni magazine called the heretic in the temple, imagine calling Robbie a heretic, uh, <laughs> has become a major force at the university. And so popular has the program been and as it's known more and more across the country, as you heard this morning, it's been copied in scores of universities. We all know that about Robbie, and if you've carefully read his CV in your notes today, you learn about his education at Swarthmore and at Harvard and at Oxford, and you learn about his services to the nation on the President's Commission on Bioethics, and you read about, read about all his books and essays. But there's one thing that you don't know about, and this is a hidden talent that uh, if you can get him to sh share it with you, you'll be very pleased. If you want to hear the best West Virginia bluegrass you ever heard, sung and played on a banjo, Robbie is your man. <laughs> this summer I found him in the California Redwoods at an impromptu jamming session with another banjo and a bass to an admiring throng. He's done great work in education, but on that issue, neither Madison nor Wilson can equal him. <laughs> it is my great pleasure and honor to introduce Robert P. George. Thank you very much. Uh, well, Peter, you let my secret uh, out of the bag. Fellow heretics, <laughs> I'm deeply honored by the invitation to address you this morning. It's an honor in every case to be invited to participate in the affairs of the Manhattan Institute, which I admire so much, the leadership of people like Larry Moan, people like my great friend Paul uh, Singer. I go around the country everywhere quoting Myron uh, Magnet, that great man of, uh, of wisdom. Uh, so this is a wonderful uh, opportunity for me. Now, uh, I lack the credentials, frankly, to speak to you with any authority on matters of uh, economics. I'm a great admirer of the free market. I'm going to say why in a few minutes. But uh, perhaps you'll want to take what I say uh, with a grain of salt. Uh, growing up in West Virginia, the eldest of five brothers. I'm pretty sure I was the only boy or the only child in the state and perhaps in the nation who managed to lose money on his lemonade stand. <laughs> now I thought I was a smart guy. I said I've got these four younger brothers. I can get them to work for free. Now my parents wanting to teach, as all good parents do, the principles of the free market, the principles of business, required that I buy my own frozen canned lemonade that you reconstitute with the water. So I had to make an investment. I had to put out some money. My mom didn't just give me the lemonade. Okay, fine, I understand that. So I bought my frozen canned lemonade. I mixed it with the water. We set up the stand. I had the boys there working for me for free. Doesn't get better than this, I'm gonna get rich. What do the boys do? Well, of course, since I've got them working, I think I don't have to go, I don't really have to pay attention. Uh, I own this business. I can go off and play baseball with the other older boys. I come back, they drunk up all the profits and given them away, to, given the lemonade away to their friends. So I don't know if I'm the guy you wanna trust when it comes to free market uh, principles. But I am a great admirer 
uh, of, uh, of the market. And I do want to say why before going on to what I hope will be uh, some practical matters that will be useful to you. Uh, my original uh, thought was that I would come and, and speak with you about the value and the values of the market economy. Uh, but Howard Husak uh, kindly called me a few weeks ago and told me who else was going to be um, on the panel, and I quickly uh, realized that uh, you were going to be taught by great experts on the value and values of the free economy uh, more than I could possibly uh, teach you, that I really had nothing to add uh, on that. And so instead, I would talk about more practical matters, which Howard correctly urged me to do, about how you affect, how you reform universities when it comes to uh, the teaching of principles of the market economy. But I can't resist anyway saying just a few words right here at the beginning before we get on to those practical uh, matters about the value and values of the market economy because I think it affects both the reasons why we do want to teach differently and better than the way we now teach in this area on campuses. Uh, and it is uh, at the foundation of our motivation to concern ourselves with these, ma ourselves with these um, matters at all. I think fundamentally we're concerned about the market economy because we share the conviction that the market economy serves the flourishing of human beings. That's what it's about. It's not for some abstract reason, reasons captured in some platonic form somewhere. It's the concrete flesh and blood well-being of human beings that we're interested in. It's a humanistic impulse, contrary to what perhaps some of the critics of the market economy believe, who see businessmen as cold-hearted uh, exploiters and see the market as this uh, institution of exploitation that, that, that uh, is, is uh, managed by people who have no care at all uh, for human well-being. On the contrary, it's for the sake of the flourishing of human beings, the well-being of human beings, that we care about the market economy because the market has proven that it serves the common good of people, including the common good of fairness, properly understood and not abused, in the benefits and burdens the sharing of benefits and burdens of our common life. Now, it certainly serves the cause of freedom, considered as itself an imp important uh, aspect of human flourishing. Free people in free institutions, including the institution of the market, as an institution that, as we heard this morning from our panel, uh, also undergirds and supports the free institutions of our legal and political systems and other aspects of our civilization. But it serves other profound and important values as well. The market serves as an indispensable counterweight, especially in the modern period, to government itself and the power and authority, potentially overweening power and authority of government, and thus it provides a bulwark against tyranny. And the market also functions, and I think this is very often overlooked when we put all the emphasis on the role of the market in uh, constituting and in protecting individual freedom, it also works to protect and preserve the autonomy and authority of the key institutions of civil society that are absolutely essential in their flourishing to the flourishing of our society as a whole. Free institutions are undergirded not only by the market, but also by the institution of the family. Also by those institutions that assist the family so centrally in its fundamental mission of rearing children who are on the whole, producing people who are on the whole, nobody's perfect, but on the whole, conscientious, honest, hardworking, civic-minded folks. Folks who obey the law, obey the rules, behave uprightly, most of the time, at least, not out of fear of legal punishment because the legal system couldn't function if that's the only motivation people had. The legal system, well, I can tell you, this is my field, philosophy of law. If there's one thing philosophers of law agree about, and we don't agree about much, the one thing we agree about is that if the law had to rely on its coercive force, on the fear of punishment, to get people to do what we need them to do, it would very quickly break down. We can rely 
on fear of punishment. But 95%, we have to rely on people doing the right thing because it's the right thing, obeying the law because it's the right thing uh, to do. And to get those people, you can't produce them. Government can't command that they exist. The whole government institutions depend on them existing, otherwise the system breaks down. But they can't be brought into existence by a governmental command. The legal system can't produce them. Business firms need such people, right, to be employees, managers, people who will show up at work on time, not drunk or on drugs, who won't steal, even if they see the opportunity to do it. But business can't produce them. The market can't produce them just by itself. It relies on the institution of the family, which in turn, of course, relies on other institutions of civil society, the so-called little platoons, the subsidiary institutions that support the family in its essential mission, religious institutions, civic associations such as the Boy Scouts and the Campfire Girls, those institutions that play the fundamental role in inculcating the virtues that had better be inculcated in people for the market or the legal system or the political system to flourish. So the market plays an essential role there too in protecting the autonomy and the authority of those institutions, which are all too easily pushed out of the way when there is not countervailing power to government power by the growth and the authority and the intrusiveness of government. The market, properly functioning, properly regulated, is moreover a great engine of social mobility. We in the United States, this nation of immigrants, we have every reason to know and to appreciate that, perhaps, perhaps more than any other people who ever existed. I'll bet if I did a survey in this room, a great many of you would be folks like me, whose grandparents or perhaps great-grandparents came from Europe or Asia or elsewhere, comparatively poor people, laborers, people in professions or trades or areas of life, economic life, that are considered lowly. But as a result of the social mobility made possible by the market, have been able to rise. That's an enormously wonderful thing. If you're interested in human flourishing, then you've got to be interested in social mobility and what makes social mobility possible. You've got to have some respect for the market. I've spent, uh, I've, I've visited Chile a couple of times talked with a lot of folks down there, I'm sure some of you have uh, as well, who've witnessed the miracle of literally millions of people being lifted out of poverty by the functioning of the market, by the introduction and introduction of market principles in the market economy. If you care about human beings, if you're not cold and heartless, you're not going to turn away from the market. You're going to be concerned to make sure that the market can fairly and effectively function in that important role. In fact, I would say that together with the institution of marriage, the market is the greatest anti-poverty program ever created. You want to get people out of poverty? Well, you got to rebuild the marriage culture where well, that's broken down. We've learned that all too well. But you'd better have a system of economic exchange that will enable people to rise, take responsibility for themselves, invest, seize opportunities so that their children can be better off than they were. Now when it comes to the study of the market economy, especially in higher education, to turn a little more closely to the specific topic that I've been assigned, I completely agree with those on the panel this morning who said that it's important to treat it as a philosophical subject and not merely as a technical one. If there's a problem with contemporary economics that I think can be understood and taken the measure of, even across the political spectrum, it really is the tendency to treat the subject and to reward, make your, your rewards in terms of tenure and salary and so forth, ex almost exclusively on the basis of technical expertise, rather than seeing it as fundamentally a matter of what in the old days, of course, used to be called political economy to see it as a philosophical question, to address it uh, as Professor um, uh, Hanley uh, proposed to address it, reminding us that Adam Smith himself didn't see it as a technical set of issues. 
He saw it what we might describe in a broad sense as a kind of philosophical problem integrated into a consideration of the goods of social life, a consideration of human flourishing in all of its different dimensions, addressed formally in different disciplinary fields, but where all of the disciplines bore on the underlying problem. I also think that it's absolutely critical, and this is so badly missing today in our universities, to study the economy, bearing in mind that for the market to function in a way that truly does serve human well-being, we have to understand the socio-moral presuppositions of the flourishing of the free economy. I've talked a little bit about that already, talking about the way in which the functioning of the economy depends on the health of the underlying structure of the family and the way in which the free economy in turn, especially in its role as providing a counterweight to government and thus preserving the autonomy and authority of the institutions of civil, of civil society, can support the family. But of course we have to be careful. My friend Jerry Mueller can tell me if I'm remembering this correctly. I think it was Marx uh, who said that uh, we'll sell the, ca the capitalists will sell us the rope with which to hang them. Lenin, Lenin, Lenin. Okay, good. I knew I could count on Jerry. Yeah, well, Lenin was, you know, all too right about uh, that in, in, in some cases. We need to be concerned about those moral foundations. There are serious moral, again, the panel got this exactly right this morning. There are serious, that's a moral problem, not just a technical problem. Understanding economics properly, understanding the free economy properly, means understanding its moral foundations and making sure that among our concerns, when we're talking about how to make the free market function properly, is not just getting the technical rules right, but being concerned about whether the other social conditions are in place and being especially concerned that we don't do anything, even in the money-making business, to undermine the socio-moral preconditions of the flourishing of the economy. We don't want to sell Lenin the rope with which to hang us. All right. I completely agree then with the panel that we need an interdisciplinary approach, and I completely agree again with my friend Jerry Mueller that when we study the free economy and when we teach courses on the free economy, we need to be attentive not only to its virtues, but also to the ways in which the corruptions that are sometimes invited by the economy can enter in the potential risks. We have to take seriously a problem such as the problem of plutocracy, undermining democracy. I, I just learned that my friend Adam Garfinkel is going to be putting out a special issue of, um, of his journal, The American Interest, on this very topic. And obviously, as Jerry said, anyone who's paid attention over uh, recent years knows that there are serious issues, moral issues, about the functioning of the capitalist framework that we've got to think about as moral problems. We don't solve our problems simply by solving the, the technical aspects of the problems. Just by getting better at the analytic side of things. We need to be thinking of the whole issue in moral terms, not exclusively moral terms. I'm not saying that there's no room for in economics for, or in political economy for technical analysis. We need the best possible technical analysis. My only point is we can't let that concern shove out the concern for the whole picture, including its moral or socio-moral dimensions. All right, now, we all understand. We're reformers. We all understand that we've got a problem in contemporary universities. Today we're focused on the economic side of things, we're on, the, on the, the way in which too often students do not get uh, uh, a sound and balanced and full picture of alternative ways of thinking about economics, that the point of view represented by so many of us really doesn't get a fair hearing. It's not that students consider it and dismiss it, it's that they never consider it because nobody tells them about it. We know that all too often that's, that's true. But look, 
Conservatives for too long, free market people, conservatives in other domains, for too long been cursing the darkness. Got to light a candle, and that's why you're here, obviously. You don't want to just curse the darkness. You want to light a candle. But that means we've got to break through the screen. We've got to break through the screen. We have to make the contemporary university live up to its own ideals. Now, it makes it easier that contemporary universities do proclaim a set of ideals that I think we completely agree with. We should. The problem is those ideals are often not honored and sometimes dishonored. But we have the advantage of those being the proclaimed ideals. So we can go to university officials, we can go to faculty members, we can go to our colleagues, those of us who are in the business, and we can say, look, it's time that we made good on this claim that we make to have a diversity of points of view represented, that the spectrum of reasonable and responsible points of view should be engaged, that there should be real debates and not monologues about economics or foreign policy or social issues or about anything else. We have the advantage of being able to appeal to their own self-proclaimed vision, which many of them honestly believe. Now it's up to us to show them if you honestly believe it, then there's some things that follow about the menu, the alternatives that have to be effectively before the students, which means having people who are prepared to teach them, who are competent to teach them, who can make the case. Now we happen to be I believe, in a period of great opportunity. Now is the time, I think, to affirm the Emmanuel Flanagan maxim that we should never let a crisis go to waste. <laughs> Universities, like other charitable institutions, are having a hard time these days with fundraising very eager to get money in. Some, including my own university, are in the midst of capital campaigns. There are many people who have interests in making sure those campaigns are successful. In other words, that the target is reached. Those people are strongly incentivized then to get money where they can, how they can, which puts those of you who are donors in a very strong bargaining position. Don't let that crisis go to waste. Now is really a time of openness to new ideas, new proposals, looking at things a little differently, opening some doors maybe that have been closed in universities if people have the resources and are willing to make them available for programs and initiatives that really make sense. Now they have to be programs and initiatives that are genuinely good, that are genuinely first-rate intellectually. Universities will not accept catechism class, at least on the right, or what's regarded as being on the right, as for the left, well, you know all you need to know, I suppose, about that. But it's not going to happen on the side of the street I'm working. Universities are not going to accept courses or programs or initiatives that are just catechism class, and they shouldn't. Again, I agree with my friend Jerry Mueller. They shouldn't. We shouldn't repeat on the conservative side the offenses that are committed on the liberal side. Our courses should be courses in which there is, and our programs and initiatives, programs and initiatives in which there is a true, fair engagement of ideas, where students really are given the opportunity to assess critically the spectrum of possibilities that intelligent people have thought about out there and proposed. I often say to my own students, my job is not to teach you what to think or tell you what to think. It's to teach you how to think more critically, more carefully, more seriously about important matters, matters that matter to you and to our communities. Okay? That's my job. Now, is it that I don't care what our students think? No, I do care, actually. I'm a citizen as well. I care about the common good. I've got some ideas about 
what is for the common good and what isn't. I think Marxism, for example, is like a really, really bad idea. But I want my students to read Marx. I teach a seminar with my colleague Cornell West. Professor West and I do not agree on everything. <laughs> Sometimes I wonder if we agree on anything. But we assign Marx. We assign Marx and Engels, Communist Manifesto. I don't hesitate for a moment to do that. We assign Hayek. To Professor West's very great credit, he doesn't object for a moment to that. Well, the students have some possibilities there, don't they, to think about. We can assess things. We can look at the historical record of the Marxian proposal. We can look to see whether the premises make any sense, whether the inferences are valid. We can do the same with Hayek. And we read a lot of other interesting people. We read Gramsci, but we read Solzhenitsyn. All right? That's how you make education happen. It's not catechism class when West and I are teaching together, believe me. Sometimes it's a little hard for the students to get a word in edgewise. But I'll tell you, real learning happens in that, in that context. All right, so we've got to do that. It can't be just catechism class. Universities won't buy it. They shouldn't buy it. In fact, in the Madison program, where we really run things by this idea, we try to create within the program not a conservative enclave. That's not the point. But rather something like what a university would be if it were what it should be, where different interesting perspectives genuinely are engaged in a critical way and where the real learning takes place. This is why I always tell my liberal colleagues, I practice what you preach. <laughs> I like what they preach. I just think we ought to go the next step and try practicing it. Now let me tell you something else. We don't need parity. We don't need equality. We don't need even Stephen numbers of faculty to transform the intellectual culture of a university, whether it's in the domain of political economy or anything else. There are a thousand people, roughly a thousand members, I think, of the Princeton faculty. I don't need 500 who agree with me in some sense or another in order to transform the culture of the university, the intellectual climate of the university. I said all along, Jim Pearson will remember this from when I uh, first appeared on his door at the Olin Foundation. I said, I don't need 500. I don't even need 50. I need 15. I can't do it by myself. I can't do it with three. But if we've got 15 people who are willing to seriously engage the established campus orthodoxy, it will transform the climate. It's what we've proven at Princeton with the Madison program. You can ask anybody who seriously observed, what was it like 10 years ago when we were about to form the program? What's it like now? One of the key things that you do when you are able to break through the screen, one of the key things that you do is you erase the possibility of people just making assumptions that they are not prepared to, criti to, to uh, uh, critically defend. In an untransformed and unreformed climate of just orthodox leftism, and it would be the same if it were orthodox rightism, it's just we just don't have very many universities like that, but where there's an orthodoxy, the way learning and thinking get squeezed out is that basic assumptions aren't criticized. People don't have to defend the premises of their arguments. People assume the pre certain premises, and they go from there. I mean, if the premise that begins the discussion is Ronald Reagan was an amiable dunce, well, there's only a few ways that conversation is going to go. But once you have a situation in which a professor in a classroom or a visiting lecturer knows that if he comes in and he starts his lecture by saying, well, Ronald Reagan was an eminent, uh, an amiable dunce, well, he's going to get some challenges. He's going to get a rough time. There are people with PhDs and students who've been educated by people who are smart who are going to be asking some tough questions. They're going to be questioning those assumptions. It's no more of this, oh, well, we all believe stuff. So forcing the assumptions, the premises, the presuppositions into being the subject matter of debate, that's the key to transforming the intellectual climate 
on a university campus. That's really the key. And to do that, as I say, you don't need half, you don't need 500 out of 1,000, you don't even need 50, you need 15. Now, getting those 15 can be very difficult. There's no question about it. But it's attainable. Not everywhere right now, we need to, especially those of you who are donors, the ideas, you need to think very carefully about where it's possible and where it's not. And I plead with you, I plead with you if you're donors, do not think if my alma mater is not ripe for this, then there's no use me being in this game. We need to stop thinking of ourselves as alumni of Princeton or Dartmouth or Oberlin or University of Oklahoma and start thinking of ourselves as friends of American higher education because we're friends of America. Friends of young people because we really do care about the intellectual and moral development of our young people because we care about our future. They are the future of the American experiment in ordered liberty. So if it can't be done under the conditions now obtaining at this university, then let's go to where it can be done. Whether, that, whether I have any previous connection with that university uh, or not, here I salute Paul Singer, uh, who has been doing a great job of helping to break through the screen at universities with which Paul has not even been associated, including mine, at, uh, at Princeton. Right? That, I think, is the way to think if we're serious about higher education reform in economics or in any other area. Now, specifically on economics, I agree with those on the panel this morning who said that the courses that we teach need not be in the Department of Economics. Now, if you can get a course going uh, of the sort that I've already said I think we need, a course that's not just a technical course, a course that's really a serious sociological and moral uh, study of uh, political economy, it's great if it's in the economics department. I'm not <laughs> objecting to that by any means. I'd love that. But it needn't be in the economics department. It can be in another department. It can be offered in an interdisciplinary program or an interdisciplinary way of some, uh, of some sort. The key thing is that it be available. I'm a little leery about making things like this mandatory. Sometimes those on the conservative side say, well, we should make it mandatory that they have a course in this or that, American history, American founding, this, uh, the basis of capitalism, whatever it is. Be careful of what you wish for. Unless you control who's appointed to teach, you may do more harm than good. You may rue the day when you succeeded in making a course mandatory, if the course is being taught in a way that's really counterproductive. Uh, um, it's very important in these courses to teach debates within the community of scholars and others who share a commitment to the market because you can share a commitment to the market but have very different understandings of its moral foundations or its social foundations. Those are very important debates and worth, ha worth having. So, I mean, many people who support the market are strict libertarians. Others are really not at all. Let's have that, let's hear the students, let's have the students hear how that debate goes so that they can sort out for themselves what they think. Now you're saying, George, you're utopian. You're a utopian, you're crazy. You're never gonna be able to get this. Uh, look, it's hard enough to get any perspective that's not on the left represented. And here you are running ahead, wanting to expose students to debates within the conservative side. But you know what? We can do it. We can do it. Part of the case to be made to university officials is that students are missing out in part, not just because they don't hear a conservative perspective, they only hear a perspective from the left, but in part because they don't hear the very interesting and important debates within the conservative side. The debates among, for example, supporters from different perspectives of the free market. It's terribly important. Now, we mustn't underestimate, again, speaking especially to those of you who are donors, we mustn't underestimate, especially in this climate, the power, when we're talking about transformation, transforming that intellectual climate, breaking through the screen, we mustn't underestimate the power of, one, money. Money does talk. Two, shame. It stings when I tell my colleagues I practice what you preach. There's a place for shaming. And persistence. Too often, 
The university comes back the first time, the answer is no, we give up. Those of you who have read the New Testament know that story, that parable Jesus tells about the woman before the unjust judge. The Bible says there's, a, there's an unjust judge who cares for neither God nor man. He only cares about himself. And there's a woman, a litigant before him. And uh, she, she comes and she says, give me justice in my cause. And the judge says, I'll get out of here. And the woman just won't give up. She says, give me justice in my cause. And he's beginning to say, well, wait a minute, this, this woman's a little crazy. Give me justice in my cause. And finally, the judge says to himself, I love the, the way the, the Bible tells this story. He says, so the judge said to himself, I am an unjust judge who cares neither for God nor man. But I'm going to give this woman justice in her cause because otherwise she may do me some harm. <laughs> persistence, persistence pays off. You know, not in every case, but in enough to make it worth remembering that. So using your economic resources shrewdly, being willing to shame where it's necessary, when there's something shameful and disgraceful that is going on, like students not getting a fair hearing when it comes to important issues uh, within the um, domain of the university's mission, and persistence, those things pay off. Also, it's very important not to underestimate the goodwill that there is there in universities, every university. Are there some people who are just biased against the conservative side no matter what it is? They do everything, they're politicized, they're going to freeze that? Of course, you don't need me to tell you that. But maybe you do need me to tell you that in my experience, on the liberal side, there are many honorable liberals who are, in fact, open to students hearing competing points of view. I wouldn't have been tenured were there not such people. I was, I mean, I was totally out of the closet. When I came up for tenure, I hadn't been in hiding. They knew what I represented. Now, I had to get a lot of liberal votes because, frankly, there were no conservatives. <laughs> All right, so the votes I got that got me through uh, to tenure at Princeton had to be from liberals. The, the, the chair that Peter was kind enough to mention that I uh, occupy, uh, it may be causing one great liberal to spin in his grave, President Woodrow Wilson, uh, but I was appointed to that chair by an administration that didn't have any conservatives in it and by a president who was not a conservative, a university president who was not a conservative. Honorable people. Find them. We can do business with them. They're open to the argument. Often they just haven't heard it. And if we are willing to raise money, if we are willing to do the work, they'll go along. That's how the Madison program came into existence. Now, it's very important that you find faculty members within institutions with whom to work, friendly faculty members with whom to work. My advice is you cannot do this exclusively from the outside. My biggest obstacle when I showed up on Jim Pearson's doorstep 10 years ago, 11 years ago, was the very recent memory, the wound of the bass catastrophe at Yale. Does anybody remember the bass catastrophe? Yeah, you remember this, okay? It's still, it's still an open wound, okay? And uh, uh, I'm sure Jim's first instinct was to pat this young professor on the head and say, yeah, you're a nice guy, and it's, uh, I'm sure you mean well, and, uh, and uh, you know, it's, uh, abstractly, it's a great idea that, that you have, but look, look what happened at Yale, right? They're not going to let anything serious happen uh, that would question the prevailing uh, orthodoxy. So we like you, but we're not going to waste money. But fortunately, Jim must have had a second thought uh, and was willing to go for a gamble. At least members of the board, like Peter, were willing to go for a gamble. And I think part of the reason that the Madison program did work, we got off the ground, is that I was there. We did have a professor with tenure on the inside to do the work that can only be done from the inside. So if you put together the key ingredients, money, and faculty members on the inside who you know, know the lay of the land, who are committed and dedicated, who are willing to take the bruises, willing to take the attacks that will come, uh, but are not going to give up, you can make things happen. So it's very, very important to work from the inside. Now, having said that, it's also very important that the donors 
remain involved. You don't just set something up, whether it's establishing an academic chair or helping to fund a new program or anything like that. You don't just set something up and trust it or trust even your close-in sympathetic faculty member to do what needs to be done to make it happen. That would make it too easy. <laughs> By all means, if you're able to get something going, trust your faculty member you're working with, or faculty members, trust the administration that has worked with you to get it through. But you remember Ronald Reagan's motto. Remember it? Trust but verify. That's a very good motto to have when it comes to academic politics and to, especially for donors who are working with academic institutions. Trust but verify. Now there's another motto, I probably shouldn't reveal this with that videotape machine running, but I'll cast caution to the wind. There's another motto by which um, uh, I've lived my life uh, that I found has uh, been very useful in academic uh, politics. Uh, Reagan's motto is trust but verify. Robbie's motto is forgive but retaliate. Uh, and if you live by that motto, in academic politics, you're going to come out okay. Well, I do want to reserve some time, as I said to Howard, that I would for questions. I, and I, I know many of you have questions. Um, I'm very happy to ask, answer practical uh, questions. Do remember that that videotape uh, machine is, uh, uh, is running, uh, so I can't let out all my little secrets. Uh, but I'm very happy to discuss them. And I thank you again for the opportunity to address uh, this wonderful uh, group and conference. Thank you. Thank you, Robbie, for those inspirational remarks, really. Uh, and time for questions. I, I know I, we've got uh, one right, yes, right next, to, next to Jacqueline. She's always the, uh, <laughs> there you go. Wait for the microphone, and uh, if you don't mind identifying yourself. Bush at uh, Christopher Newport University. Oh, we've, yes. we've met before. Yes, um, we have indeed at Princeton. And, yes, yeah. right. Oh, that was several years ago now. Um, and I'm a co-director of the Center for American Studies there. And I just wanted I, to... I've been keeping my eye on you. Oh, you have? Yeah. Excellent. <laughs> um, and your colleague. Yes, Michelle Vacris. Yeah. Mm -hmm. She's also here. Um, I wanted to get your thoughts on, um, since you were talking to donors specifically about the opportunistic period right now, about thinking about lesser known institutions like my own, liberal arts institutions, as, as good places to invest um, because the atmosphere is friendly, um, because we can take advantage of trends like interdisciplinary programs and honors programs that are, that are prevalent. And looking at liberal arts universities as um, gateways into the elite graduate schools and law schools, um, so as a good training ground, which is, you know, what we're trying to do. Yes, I, I do think that's important. Uh, and as a matter of fact, I uh, have uh, had the pleasure of, of uh, recommending to uh, donors uh, what you're doing uh, at Christopher Newport University, where my uh, former graduate student, uh, Joe Prudhomme, uh, taught. Uh, so I have a number of uh, friends there, and I admire what you're doing, and I do believe it, it should be uh, supported. Uh, but I, 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 I hope you won't take it amiss. Uh, and I know it will sound self-serving, but let, look, I want to get everything on the table, and if I'm wrong about this, correct me. <sighs> to some extent here, we're dealing with something that is necessarily a top-down reform. So much of what goes on at universities around the country is shaped by what happens in the upper echelons, or what are regarded as the upper echelons of the intellectual culture, and especially at the elite institutions. This is by no means to belittle the importance of what you're doing, and as I say, I've supported it myself. I've directed donors to, toward yours and, to, and, and, and others, but the, the, the possibilities for, Roger, Roger Hertog used to drive this home to me, and he was absolutely right, the possibilities for an overall reform are very much enhanced when you're able to break through at uh, Harvard, at uh, Chicago, at Stanford, at, at, at Yale, and I can't break through at all those places at least right now. I mean, I think eventually we'll get to them all. Reforms are coming everywhere, but it's gonna, gonna come one uh, step at a time. So uh, I think donors need to think about that. They need to, they need, it's, you know, the resources are scarce, even for wealthy people, right? Resources are by definition scarce, that's what resources are. 
Uh, and you need to think carefully about what we can accomplish where the ground is very fertile and we're really working with students, especially some students who are going to go on to elite, even if they're not an elite in undergraduate institution, it's a good undergraduate, respect an undergraduate institution where kids can expect to go on to top law schools and top, top graduate schools and that's very important and some resources need to go there for sure. But then it's got to be balanced with your concern for what's going on in the elite institutions where you're going to be shaping the people who are going to be teaching at Christopher. Newport or get jobs at Christopher Newport or the larger culture, which means in short, they should give to you and me. <laughs> Diplomatic response. Hey, Kim Dennis. Um, Kim Dennis with the Searle Freedom Trust. Hi, Kim. So good to see you. <laughs> good to see you, too. Um, can you tell us what you've been able to do at Princeton to establish that those 15 people that you want there? have I mean, have you been able to develop any full-time faculty lines yeah. through the program? Do people come as adjuncts? Are they really teaching? Or can you just tell us a little more about? I, I love to talk about this, and thanks for asking me the question. Uh, well, now, the first thing uh, that we did, it was one of the, uh, and this I, I really uh, have to uh, thank and congratulate my friend Jim Pearson for helping with. We're thinking through uh, how we're going to structure the program. Uh, Jim saw the importance of a visiting fellows program. Now the visiting fellows program brings half dozen, sometimes one or two more, established scholars, they may be tenured or untenured, but established scholars at universities from around the country to Princeton, where our students get the benefit of uh, having them around, sometimes as teachers of courses. We have a, a, a course that's, uh, that we always teach on statesmanship and we bring in uh, a fine scholar in that area to teach every year. This, this, this year it's uh, Alan Gelzo, the great Lincoln uh, scholar. Uh, we've had many other uh, fine people over the years. Uh, and sometimes in less formal ways. We created an undergraduate uh, uh, fellows society that might have 125 or 150 members uh, and provide lots of opportunities for them to meet in ways that in involve intellectual work with our visiting fellows. So even the visiting fellows who are not teaching uh, interact with our students and benefit our students, but, but some do teach. On the other side, the Visiting Fellows Program plays an important credentialing role. Because if you have a, a professor, a young, particularly in the case of younger professors, now we, we take them at all ranks and levels. We've had some very senior people, but also some very junior people. And with the junior people, especially those who are not themselves at elite universities, the Princeton credential is super valuable. Uh, one of our former fellows tells the story, uh, he was, when he came to us, we, we recognized the talent from the application, which is why we selected him from a very competitive pool. Uh, he was teaching at an unaccredited university, frankly. We saw the talent there and we brought him in. Uh, he said that he was accustomed to having his submissions to refereed scholarly journals return unopened. Mm. <laughs> and within his first semester, as a visiting fellow at Princeton, just the advantage of using the letterhead, he had three articles accepted for, for uh, publication in major refereed journals. He left Princeton after his fellowship year, spent only one year back at his unaccredited university, and then was hired by Baylor. Big step up made possible by this credentialing. So this works to the advantage of our students, and it works to the advantage of our of, our, of the visiting faculty who are part of the program. And it helps to shape the intellectual culture because the visiting faculty members are not only participating in Madison program events, they're participating in events all over the university where they're raising questions, they're questioning assumptions. You can't put on an event in another, in the economics department or in the politics department or the Center for Human Values or the Law and Public Affairs program or any other program without knowing that you know, if you, if you begin with Ronald Reagan was an amiable dunce, there's going to be some guy from the Madison program with a PhD who's going to raise his hand and say, look, I want to talk to you about something here. I want to raise some questions here. Did you defeat communists? Who did that? <laughs> um, so that, I think, is very important. Now, when Jim and I were putting things together, we had the plan to bring them in. So I knew we'd, we'd help to shape the culture by bringing them in. What I hadn't reckoned on is that we would also bring them out. Let me tell you what I mean. Boy, have I learned a lesson. 
I thought I was by myself. I thought I was alone. I thought I was the only dissenter from the left orthodoxy on the Princeton campus. Oh, there were one or two guys I'd heard about who were kind of quiet. One guy in English literature, one guy in classics. But you know, I was the only loudmouth conservative. And we don't bring in just conservatives, by the way. We also bring in liberals. Some of our best fellows have been liberals. But liberals were really interested in engaging. So it's not partisan. But I knew we would bring in because we we're interested in getting the best possible people. And if you do it in an unbiased way, you're going to get a bunch of conservatives as well as liberals. So I knew we'd bring him in. But I thought I was alone, at least as an outspoken conservative, and I didn't think there were very many who were even in hiding. Well, to my surprise, once the Madison program was functioning, and suddenly there was a lively debate between liberals and conservatives, and the intellectual culture began to get transformed, they started popping out of the closet from all over the place. Chemistry, engineering, a couple of people in my own department of politics I hadn't, didn't even know about, I'd been colleagues with for 10 years. You know, you got an institutional base in place that really encourages this kind of conversation and openness that's really practicing what the university preaches, and all of a sudden we're bringing them out. I mean, the reality is, is there are at least 20 members of the Princeton faculty who are conservative, full time. You know, they're, they're, they're not lockstep, believe all conservatives in the same way. But there are you know, tw at least 20 people who are questioning the orthodoxy. Now, I didn't know about them before there was a Madison program. Now I see them at Madison program events, raising their hands, or see them at events at other places around the university, you know, challenging the established liberal orthodoxy. It's, it's just been wonderful to see. So the key is bring them in, and you'll find at the same time you bring them out. R Robbie, for, for those who don't know the details of how the Madison program is structured, maybe you could just really quickly outline our Madison courses, Princeton courses toward a major, toward graduation, yeah. uh, and do you see the Madison model as a model maybe for uh, free market uh, education as well? Oh, oh certainly. Um, uh, we, we, our mission is to cover the range of issues having to do with American ideals and institutions, which, which is, includes the economy. That's, that's not alien to us. It's one of it. We're, we're concerned with issues of American foreign policy or America's place in the world. Uh, rule of law, constitutional law. Now, because the, the, the program was originally built around me and I've been its director, uh, the focus has been in my area of expertise. I mean, if there's one area that's more central than the others, it's constitutional law and jurisprudence. That's just contingent. Uh, in the program that Paul Singer uh, helped to build and mostly funded at Williams, the scholar who it is, whom it is built around uh, is a specialist in American foreign policy. So in that case, someone there. There's the program in capitalism at Clemson run by a former uh, Madison program uh, fellow who's really centrally concerned with, uh, with um, uh, political economy issues. Uh, at Georgetown, the uh, Tocqueville Forum, also modeled on the Madison program, built by a former member of the Madison program executive committee, Patrick Deneen. They're concerned with issues of political theory because that's, uh, that's his area. So you can have a fairly broad mission or a narrow mission. Ours is broad, although contingently, because of my area of expertise, constitutional law and jurisprudence is central. But you'll find lectures on a whole wide range of topics, including uh, issues of political economy. Uh, now, there's no single model here. There are lots of ways to do this, and, and it can be shaped in line with the circumstances and the opportunities that are available at different universities. And I've had the pleasure of being involved, usually with Jim, as well in shaping some of the programs in other places. And I have deliberately suggested shaping them differently in some respects than what we have at the Madison program because the opportunities are different in those kinds of places. So you need to be attentive. There's no, you can't do this on a cookie cutter basis. You need to be attentive to the contingencies. Um, but the way we do it, we do not offer courses in the Madison program as such. The courses that we offer are sponsored by the Madison program and funded by the Madison program in the departments. For example, our statesmanship course is in the Department of Politics. Uh, and, and, the, and the course varies from year to year. This year, because of Alan Gelzo's occupying the, the, the Garwood uh, professorship, that's what we call it. It was funded by a family in Texas, the very generous donors called the Garwood family. Because the Garwood professor happens to be a specialist on Lincoln, he's going to be talking, focusing really on Lincoln's uh, statesmanship. Uh, the donor was especially interested in making sure that 
biographical materials were used and well used in studying statesmanship, that we're actually studying the lives of great statesmen and looking at the way their own personal virtues helped to shape their, uh, their, their leadership. Uh, we offered a seminar in conservative political uh, philosophy in the philosophy department. Mm -hmm. Roger Scruton uh, came in uh, uh, to, uh, to teach that. Uh, we offered a, um, uh, a course a seminar on uh, natural law and natural rights in the Jewish and Christian uh, traditions, and that was in the religion department. The very distinguished uh, Rabbi David Novak from the University of Toronto came to, uh, uh, to, teach, uh, to teach that. And of course, there are scholars who are associated with the Madison program uh, in various ways, as members of our executive committee, for example, uh, who teach their uh, ordinary courses. They're not under the auspices of the Madison program. They're, they're just courses in uh, the Department of, uh, of Politics. But of course, as members of the Madison program family, in, involved constantly, continually in dialogue and discussion with other members of the Madison program family, uh, those courses in part get shaped. Uh, by the faculty member's involvement in the Madison program, which is great, and, uh, and, and you know, everyone thinks that's terrific, and it is terrific. Um, so the Madison program is not something you can major in, but it makes a critical contribution to the intellectual life of the campus by bringing in its visiting scholars, by hosting an undergraduate society that has all kinds of activities, by sponsoring courses in the different departments. Every single one of those counts for credit. Every single one counts for, toward a major. Uh, uh, and in other ways as, uh, as well. There are, we have a series of two, in fact, two series of speakers. Uh, we're bringing in uh, James Q. Wilson will be coming to speak um, uh, uh, this year. We've got John Finnis from Oxford uh, coming in. Uh, uh, we often have people from public affairs uh, as well as uh, scholars. Uh, who speak, Henry Kissinger has come to speak, uh, George Will has come to speak, those kinds of things. We have conferences, we had a major conference, a wonderful conference a few years ago on the contemporary meaning of the Declaration of Independence. We've, we've had a, a, a couple of conferences actually on financial uh, and economic uh, matters, uh, trying to understand the relationship between our particular kind of economic system and the political principles, the political science of the American uh, founding. Very fruitful, very illuminating bringing in you know, scholars from not only all over the country, but all over the world to discuss those issues. Great, a couple more questions. Yes, sir. Oh, now here all we right. have show and tell, a genuine James Madison program visiting fellow, Mark Bauerlein from Emory University. Uh, a moment ago, Rob, you went through um, universities. Uh, you mentioned Harvard, Stanford, Chicago, Yale, Princeton. Do, do you think that the elite public universities pose special problems, maybe too large, too unwieldy for, for these kinds of reforms? No, they, they present special opportunities, not so much special problems. Um, I mean, here the public has a direct stake. I mean, a very direct, I think the public has an indirect stake in what goes on in the private universities as well. And of course, the line between private and public in the contemporary world, because so much of what goes on even at Princeton is publicly funded, frankly. Government, you're paying for it. Um, but in the private university, and the public universities, it's very direct. And obviously, in most places, at least many places, probably most places, the public doesn't approve of this monologue that goes on in universities. The public doesn't approve of, of, of students being indoctrinated, essentially, because only one point of view is so often presented. So the public can help to bring pressure for reform in those universities. Now, there, many of you have probably followed the goings on at the University of Texas where different professors have made efforts at reform there that have involved trying to marshal public opinion uh, and uh, work with the state legislature uh, to get some uh, reforms in place. But of course, some of the state universities are among the most eminent universities in the world that shape scholarship and the scholarly agenda at all the other institutions. So what I, the ones I mentioned, uh, Harvard, Yale, Stanford, you know, Ch Chicago, those, uh, to that list, I should also add places like University of Virginia, University of Michigan, the University of California at, uh, at Berkeley. You know, the great uh, centers of scholarship that really s put out such a large number of the graduate students who themselves then occupy positions in elite universities, including small colleges like Christopher Newport, but also Williams and Amherst and Swarthmore and Oberlin and Carleton and so forth. So uh, those institutions put out the students, and they also tend to be the homes of the scholars 
whose own scholarly work has so much influence on the work that's done by other scholars in their disciplines around the country and around the world. On that hopeful note, please join me in thanking Robert George and all Thank our you all. members Very today. Much. Thank you. I think it is clear to believe in the power of ideas. Fresh thank you to the Manhattan Institute.